the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Ready for the Word of God. Yeah. We've prayed, we've gone into the presence of God, and man, don't you like that reggae beat? Yeah. Cameron is the coolest school teacher, I think, in Southern California. Um, but I mean, just what a great, a great job the uh, music ministry does here at The Rock. And those of you who were here on Friday night, um, Pastor Jim and I snuck in the back. I'm sorry, we, we violated the gender uh, prohibition. And, uh, but I mean, John Wineglass, I mean, I, I just was, I was awed at uh, the music and then the whole team how they flow together. Uh, it was just wonderful. So congratulations to all of those who partake, uh, you know, who put that together and who volunteered and made it such a success. So are you ready for the Word of God? Amen. Amen. We're going to speak tonight on the power of understanding. We're going to get right into it because uh, I'd love to cover, if I can, what we have tonight. The power of understanding. And um, my heart is to, is to what can I say is to instill in you a, a hunger tonight that you can take into the new year that I believe God's going to impart just an understanding to you. Um, the power of understanding, I'm going to start with a scripture from the book of, uh, of Proverbs, which was Solomon, the wisest man in the whole world, gave these words of advice to his son. And I want you to see how many times the word understanding is in this scripture. It's from Proverbs chapter 2, and it's going to come up on the screen. But Solomon wrote, writes to his son, and he says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you. I want you to look at the symbology of the language. He's not just saying, just take my words and, you know, put them on the shelf or do something. He says, if you take my words and you treasure them, so that you incline your ear to wisdom... And apply your heart to understanding. You see, you don't get understanding just by being around. You don't get understanding just by coming to church. There is a, an application of the heart. There is, there is an intentional... I mean, it's like watching, you know, if you bought a lottery ticket. I'm not recommending that you do, but if you have bought one, you watch the screen and you're attending to what the numbers are they are going to be coming up there because maybe you're a winner. But that's a very poor example, but I'm just, you go what I'm saying. There's an attention that you have to give to it because you don't want to miss what is, is coming. He says, you incline your ear to wisdom, apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure. You know how people go on a treasure hunt. The Bible says that our search for understanding is like going on a treasure hunt. We're finding something incredibly valuable. The power of understanding. He says, if you search for her as hidden treasures, he says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. Understanding comes from God. And my heart is to, is to put into your hearts tonight a hunger. I would like to stir a hunger for the Word of God. Um, I, I tweet a lot in, in terms of uh, Twitter, and those of you who use social media. My wife's wonderful on Facebook, but I love Twitter. And I tweet a... Um, a statement that says a boss makes people to eat a leader makes them hungry because you know what when we have our own hunger we will go after something ourselves not just get our needs fed but we will pursue and we will have a hunger to attain what we need you know Lisa and I we uh, cut our teeth in ministry with Reinhard Bonker I was his television producer, Lisa was the journalist that we traveled the world with Reinhardt for three and a half years. Got to see those massive crowds, healings, miracles, signs and wonders. I remember my very first crusade being in West Africa in the country of Ghana. We were in a little town called Sekondi Takaradi. It was a little small town on the, on the uh, west coast of Ghana. And we did a six-day campaign. It was either a five or a six-day campaign. It ended on a Sunday night. 
And as we finished the final service and people had come and gotten saved and people gotten healed and it was a marvelous uh, crusade. It was my very first time to see miracles, first time to see on that type of uh, sort of platform and an event to see blind people get healed. And, you know, I was just coming out of journalism school and I wanted to document everything. But as the last person was leaving, you know, this, uh, the crusade and the crusade was right over, people arrived who had been walking for a week. And they said, we've come for the crusade. And we said, it just ended. They walked for a week. I was staggered. I mean, we prayed for them and we loved on them. And we did whatever we could, but... I was, I was staggered that anybody would walk for a week to come to hear the Word of God. But I saw there the incredible hunger as we work in different countries. We were in Holland just, a, um, uh, just about, a month, about a month ago. And there were people there testifying from the unreached and from the most persecuted countries in the world. And people got up there from the Maldives, which is an island, and it's 99.99% it's, it's uh, Muslim. They don't allow any Christianity. You can be jailed for 10 years for having a Bible inside your home. Can you imagine? And so we often just take the Word of God for granted. We, we take it, you know, that, oh, we can just, you know, we've got eight or nine Bibles in our house and we have them on the shelf. And we don't understand how hungry the world is for what we got and how much more we need to appreciate what we have. And I believe that this coming year, that this is going to be an infusion of, uh, of revelation, that we are going to get such a hunger to grow in understanding and to come to a place of much deeper revelation of, of, of knowing the scriptures than we've had before. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, you know, people have not always had um, this word, the... Um, First crusade I did with Reinhardt was, was in Ghana. The last crusade I did was in um, the city of Riga. We actually had the very first crusade that, I, that we know of that was ever held in the former Soviet Union. After 70 years of no Bibles or of churches being wiped out, of virtually no freedom of expression or freedom of religion, and the Latvian uh, believers were, you know, maybe, maybe stretching their, their faith and they were, they were stretching their muscles in terms of, of bucking against the Soviet Empire at that time. And we were in the city of Riga and 10,000 people came together for a crusade. As far as we know, the very first crusade that had ever been held in the former Soviet Union for 70 years. And Reinhardt was refused his visa. His number two guy took it, Peter Vandenberg, and, and five of us went in there. It was a very unique experience. And, and 10,000 people, and the power of God moved, and people got healed. And, but what was so touching to my heart is that the believers stood on the platform looking at this crowd of 10,000 people and just began to weep and cry. And they said, how many of our brothers and sisters in, you know, Siberia wept and, and died and cried out to God to see the day when the, the gospel will once again be preached openly in our nation. And it was such a heart-touching moment because here was a nation coming out of 70 years without the Word of God. And it just put in my heart, you know what, we need to appreciate what we got a lot more. Our freedoms that we have, that let's not take them for granted. We need to thank God for them and we need to appreciate them and take advantage of them. Amen? You must realize the Bible didn't exist. There was even a season in Israel's history where for 50 years at least, at the time of Manasseh and Josiah before he became king, for about 50 years there was no scriptures. Then they found one, one copy in the temple. It's an incredible, you can read in 2 Kings chapter 22, read the story of how Josiah is an eight-year-old boy. It was 10 years later when he was 18 that he found the scriptures. And what it meant to him when he finally read them and he was able to, you know, turn a whole nation back to God and bring them back to the word of God. But uh, the scriptures haven't always been with us. And 
remember the printing press was only invented in the, you know, the 15th century or the 1490, I think it was, or 1460. It was invented by a Christian, Johann Gutenberg. We've actually been there in, 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 in uh, Strasbourg where they have the a statue of Gutenberg and where he invented the printing press. But I want you to understand that when he invented the printing press, in those days, much of the scriptures were in Latin. People couldn't understand them. You must realize that the Bible couldn't, you couldn't just go to the Barnes and Noble and buy a copy, or you couldn't go online to Amazon.com and just get it. You couldn't get anything like that. I mean, the Bible was the most precious thing, and for the lay people to be able to even read it was, was an astounding privilege. When Gutenberg invented the printing press, he didn't just see it, oh, I'm going to make a million bucks because I'm going to print all these books and I'm going to make myself. You know what his primary motivation in inventing the printing press was? It was multiplying the Word of God. Amen. I want to listen to what he wrote. It's going to come up on the screens. This is what Gutenberg wrote in about 14, the 1450s. When he saw the press, he said, yes, it is a press. Certainly. But a press from which shall soon flow in inexhaustible streams the most abundant and marvelous liquor that has ever flowed to relieve the thirst of men. Through it, God will spread His word. A spring of pure truth shall flow from it like a new star. It shall scatter the darkness of ignorance and cause a light heretofore unknown to shine among men. Isn't that amazing? He saw. Now we have the ability to get this word. We can get it at the touch of a button. We can get it. We have such an amazing opportunity. Whereas to these people, it was such a valuable treasure. So I want to just challenge you and hopefully give you something um, that will stir your hearts for this new year. The first thing I want to just talk about is the power of understanding that Number one, we learn to value the word. And you need to value understanding this word. All right? And understanding this word, it's, it makes a difference between whether you're going to bear fruit or not bear fruit. If you understand this word, you will bear fruit. If you don't understand it, you won't bear fruit. So I'm going to show that to you in the scriptures. You all know the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. And we pick it up in verse 18. Jesus is now telling the disciples what the, what the parable means. You know, a sower goes out to sow and it lands on different soil. And one does this, one does that. And, and then at the end of it, the disciples say, what does this mean? And Jesus now is explaining the parable of the sower. In verse 18, he says, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives the seed by the wayside. What is the ability of the devil to steal the word? It's when a person doesn't understand it. Are you with me? When you don't apply your heart to understand and to really understand, because it's not just, oh, well, maybe I'll get it, maybe I won't. It is an intentional, passionate heart cry to God, I want to understand it. I want to come to terms. I want to understand these truths, these mysteries, these things that you've put into your word. I want to understand them. Now we look in verse 23, and it goes on to say in verse 23, but he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. What's the ingredient? They hear the word and understand it. The power of understanding is whether you're going to bear fruit or not bear fruit. If you understand it, you will bear fruit. Thirty, sixty, a hundredfold. A hundredfold increase of the original seed is a ten thousand percent multiplication of it. How many of you want 10,000% increase of God's Word in your life? Amen? You've got to understand what God has given us. So we need to really want to appreciate this. And, you know, um, I, I did a documentary. Of, we've been traveling a lot lately. And we were, we've been in, you know, Cuba. We've been in, in, in Samoa. And right before that in Holland. And then before that we were in Israel doing a documentary on... Thank God for Israel. 
just blessing the nation of Israel and thanking God for the Jewish people and for all that has come to us through the nation of Israel and through the Jewish people. And in doing that, we, we got to travel through the country and interview people and we, 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 we were able to go into Jewish homes. And, you know, one of the top uh, uh, Jewish scientists in the country, we had Shabbat dinner with him and, and then him and his, his grandchildren, as well as with his family. And it was an amazing experience going into a real Jewish family and experiencing a Shabbat dinner. I mean, it, it, it really impacted my faith. And that, that man told me, he said, we, as the Jewish people, we teach our children to read by the age of three. And the reason that they do that is that the children, he says, because it's going to take them a lifelong to, to get the word of God into their lives. And we start them at the age of three because this is a lifelong journey that they will never stop. And the reason they teach them to read at the age of three is so that they can interact with the Torah. And we were there and they had a four-year-old at the table. They spent 20 minutes just going over the word of God. And the four-year-old, I mean, he was throwing out scripture and he was in interacting with them in Hebrew. I mean, it was really something to watch. Worldwide, the Jewish synagogues, they follow the same uh, scriptures. They, they all read Genesis 15 or Genesis 16 and each week they move through. So all the synagogues around the world are on the same page. These kids know the word of God. And so that to me was so impactful. And there's two scriptures that are so strong in the Jewish in history. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus quoted it to the devil. Jesus said to the devil, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The, the word of God has got to be bread every day. It's got to be life every day. It's got to be something that we, that we, that we, we digest and that we eat and that we, we value and that we apply our heart to understand it. Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, we saw this in action in Israel. It says, God speaks to the Jewish people in verse 6 and says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And almost everywhere you go in Israel, on every gate, there's scriptures. Actually, there's a little place and there's scriptures inside the doorposts. And so, you know, we have to get understanding. And how do we now get this understanding? I just want to give you a few pointers and a few tips that may help you as we go forward. I want to, first of all, let you, you know, uh, this is another tweet that I put out. It says, if you want to truly understand something, try to change it. We've all had an a, a education in that, in the whole health healthcare debate that's gone on in the country. Try to change it and now we all have to discuss what it's all about because we're having to understand what it is we have or don't have. So there is a thing where you have to wrestle and come to terms with understanding something. But I want to say this, that ignorance is a killer. Ignorance is a killer. You may not think that Oh, well, you know, if I, if I know it, it's, it's no big deal. It's just, you know, it's another book. You know, some people, that's their, that's their calling and they need to understand it. You know, the scriptures is for everybody. The scriptures are for all of us to understand. The scriptures, no matter what phase of life or whatever you do, the understanding of this word is something that's foundational to your future. It's foundational to everything you will ever do in your life. Amen? And you cannot be ignorant of the word of God. Hosea 4, 6, God says these words. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priests before me. Because you've forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. People, people perish, the Bible says. It's not a question of, oh, well, you know, you know, just they, you have a, a more inconvenience in your life. The Bible says it can be life or death. Now, we work in all these countries. We work in 142 countries, the International School of Ministry. And the stories that come to us from around the world are just are, are really challenging to us. 
Now we have a, a series that we produced in the ISOM. It's called, it's, it's Jesus Our Healer Today. It's a five-part series done by Pastor Bayless Conley. One of the greatest revelations teaching that I've ever seen in five sessions that really comes at healing from the Word of God from all different angles, from whether it's the will of God to heal, to whether healing is a part of salvation, to, um, you know, he is healing in the atonement, uh, Jesus and, the, and Moses the serpent and healing and Je healing and the mercy of God. It's an amazing, amazing series. And we put this out into China. And one of our missionaries uh, came back to us and, and told us of a pastor that when he heard the teaching on sozo, the word sozo is the word for salvation. But in the original language, it doesn't just mean salvation. It means healing. It means deliverance. It means uh, it mean, it's salvation in every facet on area of your life. And when he heard that teaching, he began to weep and cry. And he came to the missionary. And he said these words. He said, if, my, if, if, if we had had this teaching earlier, he says, my wife would still be alive. And the missionary was like, well, what do you mean by that? He said, you know, we only had one scripture we knew about healing. You must understand that to many parts of the world, they don't have necessarily the same medical system we have. They don't have, it's either God or nothing. In many ways, it's actually a healthier place than we are sometimes because we trust in everything else and if all else fails, then we trust God. But this man, you know, he only knew one scripture on healing and his wife was diagnosed with cancer. She was given about two to three months to live. But he knew one scripture, which was Isaiah 53. We'll put it up on the screen. And he wrote this in a calligraphy in the Chinese language and he threw it up over her bed. He had it on a, on a, on a, in a picture frame. And this is what Isaiah 53, 4 says. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. And this scripture was in calligraphy over his wife's bed. And she confessed it. And she stood on that scripture. And she lasted three years. And then this pastor... You know, he was trying to get anybody he could find that would come and pray for his wife. He wanted to see a full manifestation of her healing. And an American pastor came over, and this pastor went and said, Will you please come and pray for my wife? And he came into the room, and, you know, as he was about to pray, he looked up and saw the calligraphy. He says, he didn't read Chinese. He said, what is that calligraphy? He said, it's Isaiah 53. He says, that scripture has kept my wife alive for three years when they only gave her two to three months. And this American pastor said these words. Well, that scripture has nothing to do with healing. She died within a month. And that's why this pastor was crying. He said, if I had only had this understanding, my wife would be alive right now. You see, understanding the Word of God can be life and death. It's not just a game that we're playing. It's not just a, you know, an option. It's something that, you know, when your child is attacked by the demonic, you need to be able to stand. You need to know who you are in God. You need to understand the authority that Jesus has given you. Amen? And we need... A depth of understanding so that we will be able to do all that God wants us to do and that just really struck my heart this this man and, and what he went through so that is you know the first thing here is really that we you know we appreciate the Word of God and then our second point is here let me put it over here Number one, when we appreciate the Word of God, we value it. Number two, that ignorance is a killer. And then number three, we need to learn to maintain what God does do in our lives. See, you know, one preacher said it this way. He says, 
It's an unfortunate thing as Christians that we leak. You know, you can be worshiping God, have the glory of God and be, you know, just full of God and just full of His joy. And then you go to sleep and you wake up in the morning and you think a truck hit you in the night. And somehow that something dissipates and we leak. And we need to learn to put those patterns into our lives that enable us to maintain the revelation that God's given us and to come to the place where we keep at that place of, of growing in our revelation and not receding and going backwards. In Hebrews chapter 2, we'll put it up on the screen. We may, we're talking about maintaining. It says, this is the writer of Hebrews writes, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we've heard. Or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels was or has always stood firm and every violation of the law, every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think that we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus Himself and then delivered to us by those who heard Him speak? The Bible says, you know, we need to take very careful heed to what God has given us. We have to protect it. We're not allowing the enemy to steal it away. We're going to get into a depth of understanding. So the more you understand, the more you hold on. Amen? Amen. And we've got to maintain what God has already given us. We were missionaries for a number of years in, a, in, in the country of Nigeria. And, you know, when we arrived there, it was in the early 1990s, and, you know, the, the roads and, and, and the vehicles were, were just battered. The, 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 the environment is very harsh. And we would take taxis for the first maybe four or five months. We were waiting for our container to arrive and, and for us to be able to get a vehicle that we had shipped over. And so we just took local taxis. And many of these taxis were in very poor, poor condition. They were very poor states. And sometimes there was a coat hanger that you know, held together the door. Sometimes you had even rust in it. You could watch the floor and the ground as you were traveling along the road. I mean, it was it, to see that, that everything was not well maintained. And one day I got into a taxi. I arrived at the airport there and I, and I, I got into this taxi and it was magnificent. Everything worked. Everything was beautiful. And I, you know, I, I just was so curious. So I booked that taxi almost every day for about two weeks. I'm like, can you come back tomorrow? Can you come back again the next day? Can you be my permanent taxi? Can, can I hire you? Because everything in his car was so well maintained. And I finally had to ask him, I said, you know, why is it that all these other taxis are falling apart? I said, but your taxi is incredible condition. I said, how many miles do you have? He said, I have a quarter of a million miles, 250,000 miles. He said, I was trained by an Italian mechanic. And he said, every single Friday I change the oil. And every single week I go through my vehicle and anything that's wrong in the vehicle, I fix it. And you know what he is, after a quarter of a million miles, that car ran beautifully and it was in magnificent shape despite the condition of the roads. And God, I really felt, used that to, to bring a truth into my life saying, you need to maintain. It's not enough to get something. You have to maintain it. You have to keep it in good repair. Keep it in good condition. We need to keep our relationships in good repair. We need to keep, you know, our families and, and our businesses and our finances in good repair. We have to learn to maintain things. Not just to get them. Amen? Give the Lord a hand if it speaks to your life. I just read recently about a... Can you believe it? Somebody buys a lottery ticket. I don't want the lottery tickets tonight. I don't, I don't play the lottery, but I did read this and it fascinated me. A guy buys a ticket. It's a Powerball thing or whatever in Florida. It's a $16 million winning ticket. It still hasn't been claimed. It just expired on the 22nd of November. $16 million. Somebody didn't even have enough. It was so careless that they bought a ticket that's a $16 million ticket and it's expired. Now it's, it's useless. It was a winning ticket. That's carelessness. And so many times we let treasure go through our hands because we're not careful with it. Amen? How do we get this understanding? 
Are you getting anything tonight? Yes. You have to learn from people who have understanding. This is a key point, point number four. You have to learn from people who have understanding. I, I love the movie The Pursuit of Happiness, which is, uh, many of you know Will Smith. It's based on a true story. It's actually um, the story of, of, of Chris Gardner, who had a one-year struggle with homelessness. And, you know, this, this guy has got his little kid on the streets of New York, and, and many of you may have seen the movie, but he is really desperate, and he... He, he knows that you know, his life's falling apart and he just doesn't know how to make ends meet and he's trying to sell these, these machines that he's got for his medical machines and he just knows that things are not working in his life. And one day he comes across a guy who's a stockbroker and he goes up to this man and he looks at this, I mean, I, I don't even know what kind of car, I try to find the name of the car and said, whether it's a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, whatever, but it's some amazing sports car. And he sees the success of this man, and he looks at the guy who's driving it and the guy who owns it. And he says, what do you do and how do you do it? You see, you don't want to go to another homeless person if you need to have help and you're a homeless person. You want to find somebody who understands how to succeed. And you need to learn from somebody who is successful. And you know what? He drops everything and he pays an incredible price to learn to do what that man does. And that man now became one of the most successful stockbrokers uh, you know, on Wall Street. Started his own stockbroking firm from a person who was homeless because he found somebody who understood and he said, what do you do? How do you do it? You see, you've got to figure out how do you to understand somebody else is doing well and they're successful. Why are they successful? What do they understand that you don't? We can just, you know, have a pity party and say, oh, it's the economy. It says, you know what? There's people prospering in this. There are people buying these massive houses and, you know, flying in airplanes and, you know, buying airplanes and yachts and boats and whatever. There's people making millions. They understand something and we maybe need to learn to understand more. Amen? Amen. And we need to find people who understand, but the most important thing you ever will understand is the Word of God. And they understand your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the foundation of everything else. Amen? Daniel chapter 11 verse 31 is a life scripture for us as Good Shepherd in our ministry. It talks about the end times. It talks about the Antichrist. It talks about the abomination of desolation. We don't quite know what that is, but there's something in Jerusalem where the Antichrist is going to put some sort of uh, item or, or, or image to worship. And Jesus said, this is going to happen at the end. And we really sense that world events are, are coming together. Uh, Technology is coming together. That we're in the end times. And it talks about, Jesus said, when you see this happen, this abomination of desolation, you know the time of the end is close. And this scripture is a prophetic scripture from the Old Testament speaking into the New Testament about what's going to happen at the time when the Antichrist comes in the time of the end, which I believe we're getting very close to now. And I believe this scripture is more relevant now than it ever was before. So let's put it up here in Daniel chapter 11 verse 31. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. And then it says, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he who is the Antichrist will corrupt with flattery. But this is the important part. It says, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. That's you and I. Even with all the stuff that's going to happen in the world, we're going to become strong and we're going to do great exploits for God. And how is that going to happen? The next verse is the key. It says, and those of the people who understand shall instruct many. You learn from those who understand. The reason we created the International School of Ministry, I looked around the world and said, God, who understands prayer? Who understands worship? Who understands healing? And I gathered the greatest teachers in the world 
and I brought them together. And I said, just impart what you understand. I want to learn. I want to learn on this. I want to... Nobody has all the answers. We have to learn from those who understand. And don't think that anybody has it all because they don't. Only Jesus has it all. Amen? Amen. Learn from those who carry understanding and carry wisdom. They're the ones who can instruct us. Amen? Amen. We'll pick up in Luke chapter 24. And then we talk about Jesus after he rose from the dead. Now the disciples are sort of figuring out, okay, who, you know, Jesus is. They, they're now beginning to see that, you know, he's, he's not just, the, you know, they had some idea of what he would do on the earth. But now Jesus has died and now he's risen from the dead. And this is one of the few encounters that we have in the record of in scripture where Jesus actually comes face to face with his disciples. Now I want you to see this interaction as they meet on the Emmaus road. And we pick it up in Luke 24. It says, then he said to them, so now what happens is that they meet the stranger. They don't recognize it as Jesus. And they say, you know, um, you know, they're all sad. And the person says, well, why are you sad? And, and, and they're like, oh, well, we thought this Jesus was going to be the Messiah. And he was going to be the son of God. And he was going to do all these things. And now he's dead. And they killed him on the cross. And now we don't understand anything. And now Jesus speaks back in verse 24, Luke 24, verse 25. He says, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, they don't even know it's yet that it's Jesus. And this man is just like expounding and sharing these depths of wisdom and understanding of what from Moses through all out the scriptures. In verse 25, it says, Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Okay, we picked it up. That's what we just read there. But in verse 28, By this time they were nearing Emmaus, and the end of their journey in verse 28. Jesus acted as if he was going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment he disappeared. And then in verse 32, listen to what it says. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? That's revelation teaching. You see, when the word of God comes forth in a way that it just burns in you, something is like, that is right. And this deep understanding that's coming into your heart, it's, it's like fire going into your spirit and fire going into your bones. Because that word is just alive. And when Jesus was expounding them, it's like, they said, we, we felt like a fire burning in us. And when real revelation teaching is being brought forth and you're hearing it, something inside of you just stirs. Because it just it changes you. There's something that's so true and real and, and it's all so tangible that you can touch it. And so we need that type of impartation. We need that type. You see, when Jesus was expounding it, they felt that. And whenever the anointing of the Spirit of God is coming forth with revelation, understanding, it's going to bring like fire into your bones. And it brings a revelation, understanding. And the more you understand, the more fruit you get. Amen? The more you understand, the more victory you have. The more the under you understand, you know, the less the devil can ever steal it away. Amen? Give the Lord a hand. My final point tonight is that we must make learning a priority. We have to make a decision that we're going to learn. That we're going to, you know, we're going to read it. We're going to listen. We're going to study. We're going to talk about it. We're going to digest it. It's not something that's going to happen by osmosis. It's not going to happen by accident. Really coming to an understanding of God's Word is something you intentionally Engage in. I'm a tremendous supporter of the Rock Bible College. Our own International School of Ministry. We have, have 17,000 training schools around the world. It's the passion of my heart is that people would catch a hold 
of revelation understanding of God's word that people will take the time and make it a priority. As you, as you end up this year and you make your resolutions for 2014 and even those who watch this later, even for the years that follow, that, that you make a resolution in your heart, God, I am going to engage the Word of God. I am going to seek understanding. I'm going to cry out for wisdom. I'm going to go to another level of asking you to, to do a deep work in my heart that's going to change me on the inside. It's an intentional process. We have to decide. And so I just, you know, I, I, I spoke to Pastor Fred Adams just about how people get it. It's going to be there's some, uh, uh, some announcements that will be made over the next few weeks. But it's the middle of January that the next school year starts. Uh, you can just go online to rockbiblecollege.com. And you can just sign on there. Uh, that's a tremendous. They have online classes now as well as live. If you want to come and be a part of a group, uh, even online, you'll still be connected into those classes. But I just want to just, that's one place that you can start. It's a place that you can intentionally engage the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And we thank uh, the, all those teachers in the Rock Bible College for what they do. Amen? Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed. Now, I just make this statement, and we're coming to the close here, that... Nobody wants an untrained pilot to fly them. And nobody wants an untrained doctor to operate on them. You know, it would be a tragedy if you go into, for, say, a stomach operation and you lie on the gurney and the doctor comes up there and he looks over you and, he, you know, you look up and you're a bit nervous and you're like, you know, doctor, you know, I, I hope, I hope that, you know, you've done many of these operations before. And he says, oh, no, no, this is my very first one. <laughs> and then you're sort of nervous looking at him. You say, well, you know, I hope that you've trained for many, many years to do this operation, doctor. And he says, no, I'm a Christian doctor. I'm just going to pray. And wherever the Lord leads, I'm going to cut. You're not going to stay on that, on that gurney at all. You will jump and you will run out that door. Because nobody wants an untrained doctor to operate on them. How much more in the things of God do we need the equipping and the training of the Word of God and the understanding of what we're doing and how we're doing it? Amen? We all need it. It's so, so vital. I'm going to close with a the, with the story. That um, the world throws many things at us. We're told that, you know, wealth is, you know, getting a new car or getting a new property or getting this, getting that. The world just throws the gamut at us in terms of what success is and what we're supposed to do with our time, what we're supposed to do with our resources. We, we have, you know, it, it's just a barrage every day, whether through the internet, through television, through media, through the sports, through every area. We're inundated with what the world's view is of success. This puts a real perspective. It's called a wealthy man's son. Listen to it. A wealthy man and his son loved to collect rare <coughs> works of art. They had everything in their collection from Picasso to Raphael. They would often sit together and admire the great works of art that they had. When the Vietnam conflict broke out, the son went to war and he was very courageous and died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified and grieved deeply for his only son. About a month later, just before Christmas, there was a knock at the door. A young man stood at the door with a large package in his hands and he said, Sir, you don't even know me, but I'm the soldier for whom your son gave his life. He saved many lives that day and he was carrying me to safety when a bullet struck him in the heart and he died instantly. He often talked about you and your love for art. The young man held out his package. I know this isn't much. I'm not really a great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. The father opened the package and it was a portrait of his son. It was painted by the young man. 
He stared in awe at the way the soldier had captured the personality of his son in the painting. The father was so drawn to the eyes that his own eyes welled up with tears. He thanked the young man and offered to pay him for the picture. Oh no, sir, I could never repay you for what your son did for me. It's a gift. The father hung the portrait over his mantle. Every time visitors came to his home, he took them to see the portrait of his son before he showed them any of the other great works that he had collected. The man died a few months later. There was to be a great auction of his paintings. Many influential people gathered, excited over seeing the great paintings and having an opportunity to purchase one for their collection. On the platform sat the painting of the sun. The auctioneer pounded his gavel. We will start the bidding with this picture of the sun. Who's going to bid for this picture? There was a silence. Then a voice in the back of the room shouted, we want to see the famous paintings. Skip this one. But the auctioneer persisted. Will someone bid for this painting? Who will start the bidding? $100? $200? Another voice shouted angrily, we didn't come to see this painting. We came to see the Van Goghs, the Rembrandts. Get on with the real bids. But still the auctioneer continued. The sun. Who will take the sun? Finally, a voice came from the very back of the room. It was the longtime gardener of the man and his son. I'll give you $10 for the painting. Being a poor man, this, it was all that he could afford. We have $10. Who will bid 20 says the auctioneer. Give it to him for 10 Let them, Let's see the masters, everybody said. $10 is the bid. Won't somebody bid 20 said the auctioneer. The crowd was becoming angry. They didn't want the picture of the son. They wanted the more worthy investments for their collections. The auctioneer pounded the gravel, going once, going twice, sold for $10. A man sitting on the second row shouted, now let's get on with the collection. The auctioneer laid down his gavel. I'm sorry, he said, the auction is over. What about the paintings? Everybody said. I'm sorry, says the auctioneer. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. I was not allowed to reveal that stipulation until this time. Only the painting of the sun would be auctioned. Whoever bought the painting would inherit the entire estate, including the paintings. The man who gets the sun gets everything. If you get an understanding of the sun, you get everything. Amen? Colossians chapter 2 says, I want you to know how much I've agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea, the Apostle Paul's writing, and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures are in the sun. Amen? And if you get the sun, you get everything. And so we go back to the opening scripture from Proverbs chapter 2 when Solomon wrote these words to his son. He said, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and you will find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom and from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. Amen. If you heard from God tonight, give the Lord a hand. Amen. I want to just make sure before we close that everybody is, uh, is okay with God. And this is going to be a different altar call than, than normal, all right? One of the most tragic things that could ever happen to a human being would be that they would land on the other side of death and then have a revelation of what it's all about. Jesus actually talks about a man in Luke chapter 16 who dies. It's a rich man. And he's got a beggar at his gates. The beggar dies, and the rich man dies. And they land on the other side. And the reality and the understanding of where he's at and what is his situation suddenly hits him. 
that he has an eternity and he is now in torment and the Bible says he's in hell. And he cries out to Abraham and Abraham's there and he can see the, the poor man Lazarus just in Abraham's bosom and they have this conversation that Jesus records. Many people think it's just a parable. But whenever Jesus told a parable, he never used real names and real situations. I believe it was a real situation. Because the rich man says, please go back. I've got five brothers. I want you to bring a revelation to them of what this is, what reality is on the other side of death. It's not a game. The reality is that when he's there, he understands that it's forever. He's not only in torment, he is only asking for one drop of water to be placed on his tongue. But he doesn't get that. Because there's this great gulf in between. And to get to the other side and then have an understanding is the worst understanding you'll ever have. And that's why the Bible says on this side of death, we have grace. We have the opportunity that our lives can be made right before God. That we can be in Abraham's bosom. That we can be children of faith. That we can accept what God has given us, the free gift of salvation. That we can accept eternal life from God. That we can have every sin that we've ever committed forgiven, washed away, taken, removed from our lives. The Bible says God's done everything that He can do to provide it for us. But there's only one thing we have to do. We have to receive it. We have to accept that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He's the only person in the world that can take away sin. There is nothing else you can do. You can hum, you can, you can do anything else, you can do any kind of meditation, you can do any other type of th activity in this world. It's not going to save you. It may make you a slightly better person. But the only thing that will remove sin is if somebody pays for it and there's only one person who ever paid for the sin of the whole world and that's Jesus Christ. And the fact that He paid for your sin does not make you forgiven. The fact that He paid for your sin means that you can be forgiven. But you have to accept Him. You have to receive Him. You have to embrace a relationship with Him. And you've got to turn away from a life of not serving Him to a life where you serve Him. A life where you give your life to Him. A life where you pursue Him and put Him first in your life. And I want to give every person here tonight a chance. I want all of our eyes closed. Just for a moment, if you need to make your life right before God, I just want to see your hand. If that's you, you need to make your life right before God, just raise up your hand. You want me to pray for you. You want to receive Jesus Christ. And you need to make your life right before God tonight. I see your hand. Anybody else that needs to do that tonight? You need to give your life to Jesus Christ. And you want to make that decision tonight and give your life to Him. Just raise up your hand. God's spoken to you tonight and you know that you do not want to spend an eternity separated from God. I see your hand. God bless you. Anybody else that needs to do that? Anybody else? I see a hand back there. Anybody else that needs to do that? Just raise your hand. I see your hand back there. Anybody else? I see your hand there. Anybody else? This is, this, you're not going to have many chances in life where it's this clear that you have an opportunity to make Jesus Lord of your life. Wherever you are, just raise up your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand there. Anybody else? God's spoken to you tonight. And you know tonight's the night of choice. If you wait until tomorrow, the devil will have a chance to steal away what's been sown right now into your heart. That's what the scriptures say. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Do not put this off to another time because you don't know that you have another time. Is there anybody else that needs to make that decision tonight? Just raise up your hand. I see your hand. Anybody else? Please don't hold back. Please tonight, you're in the safest, most friendly place. I see your hand back there. Anybody else that needs to do that tonight? Just raise up your hand. Anybody else? I see a hand back there. They're back in the, in the, in the, in the room up the, at the back. Anybody else that needs to do that? I want us all to stand in the presence of God. If you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, I want to have the privilege of leading you in a prayer to salvation. Those of you online, you can make this decision as well by clicking just the blue button. But we will going to pray here first. 
I'd like those of you who raised your hand and you want to make a decision tonight, you want to change direction, and tonight you want to make Jesus Lord of your life and you want to give your life to Him, just step into the aisles and I want you to meet me up front as we sing a song. Just come up and if you didn't raise your hand but you should have, please come and join them as well. This is your opportunity and this is your hour and this is your chance. Just step into the aisles and meet me up front here. else I want to say this Jesus went to a cross and paid the ultimate price the little girl can come because please just somebody who's with her you can bring her up you know the girl behind you there she can come up if she wants to let her come up as well she can come up she raised her hand back there anybody who did there were a number of other people that did anybody else that needs to do it if you didn't have enough courage to do it, I'm going to ask that right after the service, there'll be people who are prayer people up here. And they will be willing and able and, and, and will be happy to pray with you. And I want us just to bow our heads and let's pray in agreement with those who've had enough courage to come forward. And may God touch your hearts. I don't want you to pray this prayer to me. I want you to pray it to Jesus. Let's pray it together. And all the congregation together with it, with these people who came forward. Say, Dear Jesus, I thank you that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on a cross for my sins and for my salvation. You died a horrible death and you went to hell in my place. I believe that you rose from the dead, that you're alive right now, that you're here in this place. I turn away from evil. I turn away from sin. I ask you, Jesus, wash my life. Wash my heart with your precious blood. Forgive the past. And I ask you now, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. From this day forward, help me to serve you. I thank you now that I'm saved. I'm a child of God, heading for heaven, denying hell. I give my life to you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. God bless you. God bless you guys. God bless you. I want you just to, if you can look to your left and to my right, this is Pastor Joel. He's going to just do two more things because I've already prayed with you. Just give you some free literature and also introduce you a program called SBT, Spiritual Personal Trainer. It's a friend for five weeks that will help you to get stronger in your faith. We all need friends. It's just an optional program if you want to be a part. But if you can make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel. He'll do that to you. God bless you. Amen. Let's give him a hand. Amen. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.